everyone. Everyone in my Recover You group knows who I am, but for everybody else, I am Kyleen and I am a betrayal trauma recovery coach guiding my clients through a unique process of recovery that includes physical, mental, and emotional health support. And today for the Recover You Facebook interview series, I am with Jordan and I'm so excited to have her here today. Um, Jordan, some of the things I really uh, appreciate about you is your honesty and vulnerability in sharing your story. So Jordan started a TikTok page a couple months ago when she discovered that uh, her husband was a sex addict and she has just been so bold in calling out the lies around sex addiction, addressing tr trolls, total trolls in the comments and just calling them out. And I just have admired you so much. I did not share my story until I was um, a year and a half in recovery. And there were so many times where I did want to go on and talk about it. And so I think there is something really special to the fact that you are sharing it in the midst of the pain because the, um, the realities of it are never more real than when you're in the moment. And so you're really sharing exactly what it feels like as you go step by step through the process. And I think that's so helpful for so many women that are just now discovering this um, and, you know, are probably feeling as shocked as we did. Um, so I would just be curious to know, you know, what was it that made you willing to go public and to share your story with something so vulnerable? There were a couple factors um, in that. Um, one of them was just that I just something about me i don't know if there's something that affects my heart i ha it's like i just feel the need to tell as many people as i can to share the message because i'm like a vegan and a mom and stuff so if it has to do with like animals or parenting you know or motherhood it's like i've just always been very easily like passionate about things yeah this was one of those things this is easily easily the biggest the biggest thing that to have ever happened in my life, mm. you know, the, one of the biggest epiphanies, I guess. I remember when I went vegan years and years and years ago, and I remember having this moment of just like, I felt like I saw the world in a different way. And I, it was like this um, blindfold had been taken off of me. And th the exact same thing happened when this, when this bomb went off, it was like the, and the more I was learning about it and the more I realized this is not just my husband. If it was just my husband, I wouldn't be talking about it. Oh, if it was just my husband, there's no way I would talk about this because I know it, it's that, like, that oh, that's personal, such a, right? Yeah, that, that would be way too personal, like way too, um, yeah. oh, why are you talking about this? This is so weird. But when I realized like, this is everyone, this is, it's happening to all of us. Mm -hmm. I was, I just felt like I have to talk about this. And then the other thing is that as I was going through and looking for help, that's what me and my husband both noticed a lot. So like our counselors and therapists and all these different people, you know, mm -hmm. they've already, oh, this is 10 years behind them. This is 15 years behind them. And then I would find stuff on YouTube and TikTok and send it to my husband. And again, a lot of it was just like, it would be professionals, you know, that it was like, we couldn't relate to them. Like we could, yeah. but we yeah. couldn't because it's like, Oh, he's a sex therapist. Of course he knows what he's talking about. Or of course he could do the right yeah. thing. And, you know, I just felt like I wasn't even going to start talking about it. Yeah. Um, I had another TikTok account that got banned. And so I was like, you know what? I'm really sad right now. And I want to do something to make myself happy. I was going to start a photography TikTok. So I put in my little name and I do all this. And I'm like, I'm going to do a photography TikTok. And I went to post the first video and I thought, this is so fake. This is so not what I'm going through right now. This is not, yeah. it's not at all. Like my head, my whole day is not revolving around photography. It's revolving around survival. Yeah. Survive. And I'm like, I need to talk about this. Like I need to. Yeah. So that's what happened. Yeah, no, I, um, I can relate so much to that because we were, we did the exact same thing. And I think everybody does with the social media age, you go, okay, well, who can I find that's an example of where I want to be in life and who's done it and who's going through it and what's it feel like? And tell me like, I, I need like the 10 step process. Right? Yes. I like, tell me how to fix this. Right. Tell me how to feel better. 
And what I found very discouraging was that first of all, a lot of things that you do find are just like all man bashing. They're so, um, anti the addict that they don't even really talk a lot about the fact that it is possible to recover. And that really yeah. bothered me. Um, and then I also really just did not find couples that were willing to talk yes. about it that had one recovered and two looked legitimately happy. <laughs> yeah. So if I did see something, I was like, okay, well you're together and you don't actually like, you seem like long suffering. Like maybe you did this cause you felt like religiously obligated to stay together to forgive or whatever. And I was like, okay, if I'm going to get through this, I want to be like legitimately happy with my partner. And I don't see people out there being an example of that. So there is a, you know, when you're talking about um, just, you know, it's the thing that's happening everywhere and yet nobody's talking about it. It's like the elephant in everyone's room that society has just said is hush hush. And, and we just don't discuss this, even though you're, it's happening to your neighbor. It's happening in your pastor's home. It's happening to your best friend. It's happening to your, you know, your cousin or your sister or whoever. And we don't feel like it's something we can just talk about which is ridiculous. It's like the yeah. dumbest thing. It's like everybody brushes their teeth and everybody knows they brush their teeth. You know? yeah. And if we can just bring it to awareness to it, number one, the men are going to get better help. And number two, the women aren't going to feel so alone when this happens. And so I think it's really cool that you decided to do that. Thank you. Thank you. So through this process, um, I'm sure you've done an amazing, I'm fascinated in two months, the level of education that you have around this topic. And I remember feeling the same way. I was like, I got like a freaking PhD in like six months. Yeah. <laughs> that's how, that's yeah. how it felt. I was like, I'm learning everything. And, so, but there's so much that you learn so fast. It's like a fire hose of information. And you've done such a good job on, on TikTok of being like, no, this is a lie. This is a lie. This is a lie. This is what culture tells us. And this is not true. So what are some of like the biggest myths that you have really pulled out in regards to sex addiction or betrayal trauma or both? Um, I wasn't really thinking about the betrayal trauma. There definitely are myths that surround that, but a lot of people don't even know what betrayal trauma is. So I feel like for them, for I, there aren't as many myths because most people don't even know it's a thing. They just think they're sad or like they don't realize this is you're traumatized. You have gone through something terrible. Um, but for the sex addiction and the porn, mostly the porn addiction side of it, because, you know, the, these sex, they're sex addicts, but they're obviously acting out, they're watching porn, they're, you know, they're addicted, they're, that's what they're using. And um, the no number one, me and my husband were just talking about this last night, is just that, you know, the reason, the excuse if, if men aren't going to make any excuses, the, there, there is one excuse that they will make. And that is that it's normal because everyone does it, you know, mm -hmm. it's normal because everyone does. That's just like, it's yeah. not, but that's what they have to tell themselves, you know, yeah. oh, well this, 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 and this guy, they all watch it. So it has to be normal. It must be normal. And then of course it makes them feel fine doing it because, you know, that's what they think. Yeah, as a functional medicine health coach, I used to always use the term, uh, it, just because it's common doesn't mean it's normal. <laughs> yep, exactly. So, and I think it totally applies here, right? Yeah, it's super common, unfortunately, and it's totally not normal, which is why so many men end up in, in pain because of it. If it, was, if it was normal and healthy, then we wouldn't have all these negative effects yeah. from it. But we have a tremendous amount of pain of, you know, these men are trying to quit and they can't. And mm -hmm. By the way, that means it's an addiction, you know, like, um, so yeah, I think it's, I think it's ridiculous the way it's just justified in culture because, um, well, you know, our culture wants to justify all of our bad habits. <laughs> all of them. Yeah. It's kind of like, I kind of see porn the same way I see alcohol, you know, it's kind of like, we look at it as normal, you know, but when you actually look at it, what benefits are there? You know what I mean? That's what I always see. It's like, yes, people think they they're different. They're very different drugs, but in a, in a way, you know, they're just so similar because they trick you into thinking like, this must be good. It must benefit me because I'm having fun doing it. But when you really look at it, it destroys way more lives than, yeah. well, it doesn't help any lives really, but oh, yeah. it, you know, the, the amount of destruction that it does is just, Absolutely. there's no, there's no con. I mean, there's no pros. The cons no outweigh the pros. Yeah. I mean, one of the biggest things, you know, as I was kind of 
forced into this education and realization is you can't participate in in the porn industry, even if it's free material, without and without supporting um, the sex trafficking industry and the abuse industry. Like there's just there's zero percent way you can do it. It's just not possible. If you go onto one of these websites and they're huge websites, and you say, "Well, I only looked at X Y Z." Well, it doesn't matter because one, you don't know if that person was trafficked when they were, you know, if they were abused as a child, you don't know if they voluntarily got into this. And it, let's just say like all of those things are like, it's a, it's a consenting adult that wants to be there voluntarily. Let's just for argument's sake, say that somewhere else on the website is illegal activity and abuse. And I mean, it's just, it's literally impossible. Yeah. And I and see it. it yeah. Um, I don't know if you've ever seen soft white underbelly. It's like a YouTube channel. And he interviews a lot of sex workers and I've watched it for years and years. So I already had oh, wow. that going into this. I already had this background of like the sex work industry and like the truth behind mm -hmm. all of it. And my opinion always has been and always will be that in some way, every single one of them, sex workers are victims in some oh. way, you know, nobody grows up when they're eight years old and is like, I want to, why I want to do this for like, no. you know, the percentage of people that would voluntarily do that for whatever reason is so incredibly small. And even in that, in that life, you're something that would lead you to make that decision. There's trauma there, period. Trauma. Massive. Yeah. yeah. And that's the thing is like they're the, um, what they do, they might be getting paid. There's no amount of money that's worth what the long-term effects that, you know, they have to deal with and the short term, you know, what they, and again, that, like you said, that's the consenting. That's not even talking about the women that are, tricked manipulated forced into this right i just there's no ethical way there's yeah. no truly there's no ethical way to go about you can't buy and sell you know people you know what i'm yeah. saying right we are not products women are not products that's yeah. and that's just the thing with porn is like it forces men as much as they deny it it forces men to view women as objects Oh, 100 percent. There's the, no way you cannot view them as objects when you're watching yeah. porn. Well, That's yeah, you have to. The, the reality of recovery is that they learn how to view all women as humans and yes. not objects. And even if they're incredibly compartmentalized, where they only objectify women in their addiction and they don't really do that in the real world, mm -hmm. um, it's still this weird sort of secret box thing. And it's like, you have to learn how to look at every single person, whether it's on a screen or in real life or whatever, the same as a person, as somebody we're all, we're all humans. Yeah. And, and that's, I think one of the biggest things of a sign of recovery is that happening is there is no separation between, um, you know, the real world and the fake world anymore because they are able to view everyone with the same value. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a huge piece of it. Okay. So um, what else have you discovered? Oh, that you what, one of the other huge ones that this, um, you know, this is just one that I just see all the time, especially on TikTok, men saying, or in women, and women say this too, you know, well, at least he's not cheating. Well, this prevents him from cheating. This keeps him from cheating. That's the thing is like, number one, obviously it is cheating, but number two, it just, the way that it just is a leads, it's a, like a line. It's just like this road, this one way road that leads directly to cheating. And it's just, it blows my mind that people, any human out there can say porn prevents cheating. It just <laughs> sounds like, it sounds like a joke. Like it sounds like the most ridiculous thing I could ever think of. And people, that's what people are out there believing, you know? Yeah. And I think that's what the porn industry and, you know, the media tells us too, because ever since well, let's just spice yeah. up your sex life by looking yeah. at the stuff that like drugs your brain and yeah. makes reality, you know, not reality anymore. Yeah. No, it's, it's absolutely that, that sentence is so like when people want to ticky tack about what well, was, did he have an affair in real life? When you say he had an affair, what do you mean by he had an affair? I mean, he had an affair with hundreds of women, if you'd like thousands, to compare yes. being virtual and reality, hundreds or maybe thousands or even tens of thousands for how long it went on. Like you want to, you want to compare women? Let's compare women. <laughs> That's, I say that. Yeah. I say that all the time to my husband. I'm like, well, I'm like, I, I, my biggest fear was you would have an affair. And now I realize, no, this is, this is it. This oh. is my biggest fear because you, like you said, yeah. I mean, there's, it's thousands, it is thousands of women. And it's like, 
it's like an affair times a million. It's awful. It's terrible. Yeah, I mean, it, it really is. I mean, um, I don't know what your um, faith beliefs are, but, you know, in a Christian marriage, my definition of infidelity is if you go out, if you go outside of our relationship for sexual arousal of any kind, that is cheating. Like, I, yes. I, like that is designed for us, right? And so, like, when people want to really split hairs about infidelity, I'm like, it. Like there's no, you're literally looking at someone other than your spouse for sexual gratification. Like, I don't know really how else to define that except you're, you know, you're yeah. having an affair. Because, Multiple. and here's the, so it's so sad because they think and they tell themselves, you know, well, I don't, because they don't, they're not talking to the woman. They're not mm -hmm. talking to the woman. But like you said, I mean, you don't, you're exchanging, you are getting satisfied off of a stranger. That's even worse. You don't even know yeah. her. You don't even know her. Well, I was getting, the only, uh, and yeah. I think you would agree with this. The only clarification I would have is they're not actually getting satisfied. Yeah. It's that, it's that fake sort of. Right. Um, satisfied. Yeah. Yeah. Right. They're seeking something. So there's something internally that they are seeking to fulfill, which is a healthy, there's something that they need, like they feel unwanted or unloved. Right. And there's, there's a healthy way to fulfill that. And instead they're filling it in an unhealthy way, or they think they're trying to, they're trying and then to. it's unsatisfying and they feel guilty and shame around it. And then the cycle continues and then they get triggered again because that initial emotional wound or trauma or whatever it is that's leading them there right. is unresolved because they're not addressing it. They just keep medicating it. Yeah, exactly. So I, I I'm um, so uh, interested to know how is it that you um, stumbled on all of this information so quickly in discovery. What is it that, uh, supported you? Um, man. Oh my gosh. It was. <sighs> because if I believe, I, I think I saw on your link that you're familiar with Doug Weiss and, um, his counseling center and. Yeah. I think I had some of that in there. I just, yeah, I just jumped in. Just, I just jumped in a lot, a lot, a lot of the beliefs and the knowledge I had of, around the sex industry and porn was already there, you know, just because I've always been, I have always been pretty passionate about just women, I think, you know what I mean? And um, healthy relationships. I've That's always been something that I've just strived to like, I want to learn about healthy relationships so I can have one, so I can teach my sons how to have one. But yeah, it's it's it just all those websites. Like I just remember uh, what, go, jumping into like YouTube, just finding pretty much any videos I could just on porn addiction, you know, just seeing what I could find there. And then, you know, the websites that I. Uh, now, how did you know how to call it an addiction? Because I think that's something that one of the reasons women don't get help right away or the, or the help yeah. that really guides them into recovery is they don't recognize it as an okay. addiction. I, I actually do have a very clear answer for this. And I, sorry, I just remembered. So very, very personal, but I will say that um, about five years ago, about five years ago, I had a friend of mine. She came to me and said, Jordan, um, I'm talking to this guy and he was, uh, he told me tonight on our date that he is a recovered porn addict. She was like, he used to have a porn addiction. He was very young. He had a porn addiction. He got recovery and he got better. Wow. And I vividly remember that night. And I remember feeling so bad for her. Oh my gosh, she's going to date a porn addict. Like this guy who had a porn addiction. That's so embarrassing. Like not that dramatic. But I remember thinking, I literally felt bad for her. Like, oh, he's an amazing man. Oh, that's too bad. That's too bad. He used to have a porn addiction. And now... I, re as soon as I found out about my husband watching porn and like all of these, we, these, all of these things started clicking in my head and I realized, oh, wow, that yeah. she was so fortunate, so fortunate to find someone who was recovered because I see it now. It's like some of the only men out there, some of the only men that aren't addicts, they're recovered addicts. You know, they did have an addiction and they've recovered right. from it. So that's as soon as I really so pause that. on that for a second, because yeah. I think that I think it would be very easy for people watching this to gloss right over what you just said. Yeah. Some of the only men out there that are, like that are not actually addicts are recovered, which is 
a kind of a bold statement, but because porn is so, it's so part of our culture now, yes. it is incredibly, like the percentage of people that struggle with this is so high yeah. that, um, it, first of all, it would be incredibly difficult to find someone that hasn't seen it. Just not yeah. even that they want to, but like, I mean, you've probably run across stuff on social media. You know, who hasn't? It's, being it's there. The it's there. Um, and, and for men to, um, not struggle with this or not have gone down that rabbit hole at one point in their life, even if it was a short period of time is, is going to be very few and far between. Yeah. Very like yeah. almost non-existent, but very few and far between like, and that's, and I think that's, that's the importance of talking about it. That you had a friend that was willing to tell you, yeah. um, her story in I'm the moment. I'm so glad she I, did. I'm so glad same. she told me that. I had a friend that told me about her story years before mine, which is exactly how I knew who to call. So I think, yeah. I mean, it's like that, that's one of the reasons that we talk about it so publicly, yeah. right? Is because yeah. it's like, we both had someone in our lives that was brave yeah. enough to kind of bring it up to the Thank surface. God. So that in our subconscious, we were like, oh, I know what's happening, yes. right? I don't know what I would have done if I didn't I, have that person. That, that's what I think. Cause she was one of the first people I texted. And I look back and the same thing. I'm like, if she wouldn't have told me, oh, he's a recovered porn addict. Right. But if I, when I found out about my husband, I probably would have done the same thing a lot of women do. You're not going to watch it anymore, right? Okay, I believe you. And they right. they don't realize you're not dealing with a, ch a choice he's making. You're dealing with an addiction he has, you know? Right. So. Yeah. yeah oh, well, my God. I'm very yeah. thankful for that. Yeah. Yeah. What? What else have you um, pulled out? I think it's this number three. Yeah, number three. Um, it's oh my gosh, this one. All of all of these, obviously, they drive me crazy. So I have a very strong reaction to them. I think but... I'm wondering if I know what this one is. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> when 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 I, when I see a comment that says um, either there's a healthy level of watching it, or whenever people think it's only an addiction if you're watching it for 10 hours a day or you're oh, yeah. five, they think it's only an addiction if you're like yeah it's non-stop it's non-stop and it's like yeah. have you ever heard of a functioning alcoholic or a functioning you know a functioning addict is still yeah. an addict well you know? that's what i think is so um hard for people to understand about sex addicts is that they are what you would consider an incredibly high functioning yeah. sex addict. Not 99% of them. You hear the term sex addict and without education, you probably go way to the illegal end of the spectrum. Like these are these little weirdos yeah. that like hide around and, you know, they play video games all the time or they're away from society or they're people that you would expect to be a sex addict. Right. Or there's the illegal side of underage behavior or whatever. Right. Or people that are getting, you know, um, you know, exposing themselves in public or whatever. And while those might like fall on the spectrum, that's not the majority. The majority yeah. of people yeah. that are in the addict, sex addict um, uh, addiction diagnosis would actually be people that you know that are incredibly high functioning that you would absolutely never guess had any issue whatsoever. Yeah. Because they only need, the thing is like people don't realize it's like you only need five minutes a day. You're getting your fix. And you're continuing to live your life. And then, you know, it's just like, that's the, like, that is an addiction because this is whenever people say to me all the time, well, how do I know if it's an addiction or if it's this? And I, my, what I've been saying a lot is if they can go a year without it, they're not addicted. If they can go 12 months without it, I, they're definitely not addicted. If they can't go 12 months, then yes, that's, that's how, that's what I say. And I know that that's not like scientifically based. But that's what I well, think because I think that's a very easy way to look at. Do you have absolutely. a problem or not? Absolutely. Because the, the basic uh, one of the tenets of addiction is if you've tried to stop and you can't, it's an addiction. It's an addiction. Yeah. So, um, uh, but one, one of the interesting things I actually posted this on your uh, page the other day oh. was the difference between a substance addiction and a process addiction. And one of the reasons that process addictions are so hard, which is sex addiction is a process addiction is because your brain actually produces the drug itself. It's an internal um, process, drug process, as opposed to an external one. And so that actually, while it impacts the brain, essentially the same in terms of the damage, uh, the difficulty that these people have when they try to stop it on their own without community, without accountability, without the support tools, 
it's, it's basically impossible for them to stop this addiction on their own. Yeah. But I think the thing that like is like guys have to know and, and wives have to know, I think that is huge is that when they, they have to have the tools and resources in order to do this. Yeah. And so coming out and saying, okay, well, I'm an addict and your wife, like you said, okay, well, you're not going to do it anymore. Right. I'm sorry. That does not work for these guys. That's what I like, say every time. Yeah. <laughs> They have to have, they have to deal with the emotional wound or trauma. So they have to get into the right counseling or therapy for that. And if you are choosing to stay in the relationship, I actually would say it's the responsibility almost of the wife to set boundaries for herself, for sure, to create safety in an environment that just was blown up and created unsafety. But then also, because if you're in a partnership with this person and you love them and you care about them and they have an addiction, you're going to put accountability barriers in place because you want them to succeed. Exactly. It's not about, and that's the other thing is, you know, people, women and men, you know, they both say, the women say, I don't want to be controlling. I don't want to be toxic. I don't want to parent him. But it's like, you're not. I don't want to parent him. You are. I'm sorry. Yeah. You it's know. like, you have to. You either stay with him and you do all of these very strict things. Cause it's like dealing with a heroin addict, you know, it's, yeah. you have to put things in yeah. place. If you don't put yeah. them in place, then you might as well call it quits because nothing is going to change, you know? Well, and I, I understand the concept, right? Like we never asked to be put in this position. Exactly. We, we did not want to have to take responsibility yeah. and parent our spouses. We wanted to be in an equal partnership. Right. However, you know, Marriage is like this. It's sh the, the roles and the responsibilities shift. Like if somebody gets sick, one person takes care of the other person. You know, if the other person gets sick, one person, you know, and, and it's what happens with addiction and you're not parenting them. You're not being toxic. You're not being mean. You're actually being a spouse and helping them. And I think that's, that's something that is not really talked about enough because there is a lot of um, uh, push, I think, against setting boundaries. And it's like, I, I don't, I do not think that's a negotiable in these situations. I think it, you absolutely have to set boundaries for yourself and for your husband. And that is ultimately what leads when both parties are involved. That's ultimately what leads to a healthy relationship. Yes. Um, but if you don't, if you're not willing to set those up and you're not willing to push back, and you're not willing to support him in his recovery, then it's going to be a bumpier road, I think. Yeah, I agree. All right. What's number four? I, I have one in my head. I think, I think, I think you're going to get there. Cause it's okay. Well, I, I, there are so many, so I, know. I don't know. I have two more. I feel like, I feel like these last two are two, like, I guess maybe two of the biggest other ones, but one of them is, um, that oh, men watch porn or use porn, um, because they are not getting enough sex. Or That's because, it. Yeah. I wasn't. That was actually number five. But I went ahead and said that one. Because I was like, I bet this is what you're thinking. This is it. Like, this is it. I, yeah, yeah. This one bothers me too. Go ahead. Yeah. It's well, so it's just, it's, and it's what I, this is what I say every single time. No amount sex cannot heal a porn addiction. Because sex and porn are not the same. They're not even remotely the same thing. They're not. I love, yeah. yeah. So, I, I love I love that you said they're not the same. I, I'm pulling this up because just last night I got this comment under video. Um, some guy goes, because it's easier than begging for it, that get old really quick, just as soon watch a little porn and get the business done and try and try to get laid. And so my response was, lack of sex from the spouse is never the reason someone becomes an addict. And often they have very willing, very attentive and very loving wives. Yes. And the second comment was, additionally, when there is lack of intimacy, it's just that lack of intimacy. And there's usually a deeper reason that that's not happening. Yeah. And I think what you, that's what you're saying is it's – why don't you talk about that? Because I know you've also done some videos on how your relationship is different since this has come out. Yeah. So it's, it's a two-way kind of like – I forget what the word is. It may be like a double-edged sword or something because, okay, the woman, the wife, she, no matter, she, and I've been there, I've been there. She could have sex with you every single day. If you're a porn addict, you're still going to go to porn. She yeah. could have sex with you every single day. But here's the thing. Yeah, that's the other thing is that men, no matter how much their wife has sex with them, they they still have this addiction. They're 
ultimately at some point is going to be a time because they have this addiction and they're feeding the addiction that they are not giving her the attention, the love, the energy. They're not giving her any of that. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it's unintentional. Like they don't even realize it. Like my husband, a lot of times was unintentional, sometimes was intentional. Mm -hmm. But the other thing is men also get to this point with porn where they just are like, they are almost like vindictive with it where they're just like, well, she's not jumping on top of me every day. So I'm just, I'm going to withhold my love from her and I'm just going to watch porn. And then they, they continue to make themselves upset because they're continuing to watch porn, not giving her anything. And they're mm-hmm. continuing to be mad that she's still not yeah. offering her. They're creating their own cycles. They're, whether they're creating, they're creating what I told my husband was like, you created your own hell and my hell too. But like you created your own hell of like this vicious cycle of you withhold the intimacy. You don't give her anything. And then you're mad at her for not wanting to jump on top of you, but you are literally starving her of the one thing she needs, which is that intimacy and affection. Like we thrive on that. I've told my husband that all the time. Like we, that's what we need. When every time I talk to him about sex, I say for me, I, what I get out of sex more than anything is a connection. You know what I'm saying? I think that's yeah. a, true for a lot of women. Of course, it's fun and we love a lot of the aspects of it. But more than anything, I want that connection with you. So if mm-hmm. I don't have that, you know, it's like, so that's 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 really tough men, whenever men view it that way. Um, and then women, it's so sad because then women they think whenever they find out their husbands have a porn addiction or their affairs or whatever it is, they think to themselves, I didn't fulfill him enough. Or it's that lie of like, if you don't feed your man and you let him go hungry, he's going to go get fed somewhere else. But that's, if he's a sex addict, it doesn't, does not matter how much you feed him. And that's the, so it's so sad because the victim should never feel like it's her fault. But in the society we're in with all of these myths and lies, they Mm -hmm. oftentimes feel like it's my fault. I did something wrong. And I think that's one of the things that I'm glad that in my marriage, I was always doing those things. I was so I can sit here today and say, look, I can tell you right now it doesn't work. I can tell you right now. You know what I'm saying? Like it's willing partner. (laughs) Willing. Yes, exactly. And it's like, I initiated, you know, you do all this and, and that's been helpful for me. I'm glad that it was like that because it helps me to understand he, it really truly is an addiction. It really truly is. His brain is warped from this years and years of years of feeding this neuro pathway, you know? Yeah. Um, I, I, uh, I'm creating a course for women that just discovered, and there is a module in there about the attic brain. Cause I think it is really important to understand. And there is a picture of a brain scan in there, um, that shows a healthy brain, a brain on heroin and a brain on porn. And, and, uh, in a spec scan, the more smooth your brain is, the healthier it is. And then the heroin brain is very lumpy. The porn brain is like worse. You can see it on the scan that it is worse. Have you? So we, yeah. Go ahead. No, uh, no, I'm sorry. You can go ahead. So it's just, um, I, I, I mean, it's like the science is there, <laughs> you yeah. know, we, but these people are, it's impacting the way they view the world. It, it literally impacts how their brain works. And so it, it's really no surprise that that then impacts how they treat their partners Yeah. Um, and how they, how they view things, you know, and then just the, uh, uh the uh, reality of porn itself as, you know, any addiction has an escalation pattern in some way, some type. Um, And with pornography, it warps your sense of reality so much that kind of what you were just saying is they expect fiction to come into the real world and it's just not possible. And so um, in some relationships, um, they will start, I don't want to say punishing their wife for that, but in a way, right? They like do. putting it on you. Yeah. And um, they may not even realize how much their personality or their behavior has changed over the course of the addiction. Yeah, they really don't. And that's the really devastating thing is like me and my husband talk every day and he looks back on 10 years and he's like, because I'm constantly reminding him of what was going on the last 10 years. And he, yeah. 
And he literally just says all the time, oh my God, Jordan, I did not. He's like, I can't believe I let it get this bad. I can't believe I let it affect me. He says to me all the time, he says, I know I was terrible to you. He Mm -hmm. acknowledges that. But he even he admits, he says, I never in a million years thought I was treating you that way because of my porn. He didn't under because because the information isn't out there. No one is talking about this. So his last thought, he just thought, oh, maybe I'm depressed. I'm stressed. I'm Mm -hmm. oh, I have to whatever the whatever the reasons are. And so so not necessarily he's excusing the behavior, just that he didn't necessarily associate that with. He never did. But now he does. Now, whenever we talk about it, he says, oh, my gosh, the porn. And I think that's one of the reasons he's willing to talk about this and willing to share his side of it because he realizes now the porn was the source of 90% of our pain, 90% yeah. of our, of everything wrong in our marriage. Mm-hmm. Um, and I always thought that I always thought in our marriage, I always thought, what is there's it? no, I saw no reason. I saw, I thought, why do we have these fights? Why do we have this toxicity? There was nothing I could see that was the source of all of this pain. Yeah. until this came out and then i just looked back and i thought this was it this was the puzzle piece that i was missing for 10 years you know well and i think the encouraging side to that is that when that is removed yeah. and they are willing to do the recovery work they get their personality back yeah so much and, and that shifts right like i one of thing and i asked my i talked to my husband about this because he's He's so not stereotypical in a lot of the ways. And so I kind of am like, how did you manage this? Because he was never, he was not gaslighting. He was not blaming me. He was not mean to me during the addiction. There was not like, but like in maybe the last six months of it, where it was like the most escalated it had ever been. And of course, I had no idea, you know, Um, there were like two instances where he got really snippy with me and, and, and it was not like remotely appropriate for the level of the situation and I was like that just is so not his personality because he's like super chill you know and I just did not understand what was happening but I'm like but he's so like that that's like a tiny such a tiny example and so many women like don't that's like every day for them yeah and and I'm like how did how did you navigate such an intense addiction and like you you were still you sh- he showed up in his life in such a positive way most of the time. It like he has like some sort of unique. <laughs> yeah. No, but I see that a lot. That's the scary thing is like I share my side, which is like my husband started really nice and calm and easygoing. And the more into his addiction that he got, the yeah. mo- the months and like the seasons that it was more severe, yeah. um, his attitude and all of that just went down like it was it did get really bad in some moments but there were some years and some months that he was that amazing nice loving person but that's the thing is like I so I share my side of like he was mean at times and he was just nasty and all this other stuff but I talk to women all the time who say their husbands were the most loving attentive men and the addiction Took it even more by took them even more by surprise because they're like, like how did you manage that? Wow, like that's, that's yeah. How you, well, and I think a lot of times what um <clears throat> what happens when they are um kind of the way you're describing, where is they're living in their limbic brain, and that that's what um the addiction does is it puts them in their limbic brain and they it gets them out of their prefrontal cortex where there is reason and patience and empathy and all these different things and so when they're totally totally stuck in the limbic that is more anger and aggression and impatience and it's basically like a super immature part of the brain basically yeah um and yeah so a lot of guys will kind of get stuck there you know and that's so 100 percent part of the addiction so when they get into recovery they um their decisions and their thoughts start going through the prefrontal cortex again and they get their personalities back so if they are you know if they do want to be a nice kind empathetic person and they're doing the steps to recovery and the behavior stops so the chemical flushing in their brain stops then they get all of that back which is awesome yeah it really is it's night and day seeing how he is now because it's been 2 months so this is the longest period of time 
in the entirety that I've known him for, I mean, the mm. last however many years, this is the longest period of time he's ever gone without it. And he is, I have never seen him like this. I've never seen him so just understanding. So, and this is the other thing is men, the men, they have the porn addictions, like they're using the porn to medicate pain, whatever they're doing. They're using that pain. They're using that porn to like medicate, um, yeah. self-medicate, whatever they're going through. They're not in touch with their emotions. They're not, um, they're not a recognized. They don't get to emotions. feel them because yes. they self-medicate them so yes. quickly. But they're so, like anxiety. Yeah. What's that? <laughs> exactly. They aren't actually feeling or talking about or any addressing any of their real emotions. So my mm -hmm. husband now the last two months, he is so in touch with his emotions. He's so able to communicate how his emotions to me, he has never done, been able to do that ever, ever. Okay. And it's just absolutely crazy, like seeing him like a normal human, like seeing him just be a human and have these human emotions and communicate with me instead of, yeah, going and doing whatever he was doing for so long and just mm -hmm. pretending like, you know, everything was fine. There's nothing wrong type of thing. Yeah. But, and that's kind of, I think, the whole toxic masculinity thing. You know, I've always kind of been confused about like, okay, well, what does that really mean? And this and that. And now, ever since having this epiphany over the porn addictions in our society, I think that one of the main, um, the main contributors to this toxic masculinity movement is porn addiction. I think that they, I think that men have porn addictions. And the way that they show that porn addiction in the way that they act is what we label as toxic masculinity, if that makes sense. Yeah. Just a hundred percent. And I don't, I just think, and I tell my husband all the time, if we could just, if we could heal men from this, from all of these porn addictions, our world would be an incredibly different, just, I mean, it would be amazing. You know, it would just be such a different place. It's like the uh, the concept, real men cry, real men feel empathy, real men feel their emotions and communicate with their wives, right? Yeah. Like that doesn't make you weak. It makes you not toxic. Exactly. And, um, uh, yeah, so I would say like through this, through this two-month two process, like has your husband just felt happier? Well, it's hard because we're so, we're so new into this and fresh into this that obviously there's a lot of pain. There's a oh, lot sure. of pain and sadness from both of us. Yeah. But the moments that are the most normal, like the moments mm -hmm. that were not that I'm not upset, we're both happier, I think, than we've ever felt. Yeah. Even though it. we're still so sad that what we're going through, it's like I'm happy that I can see you for who you are and I finally know who you are. Yes. And he's happy because he's not. He's not watching porn. He's not um, hiding anything from me. Yep. And he's just, he's finally being the husband. And I think the dad that he always wanted to be, he always yeah. wanted to be this man, but he didn't know porn was holding him back from that, you know? Yep. Yeah, no, that's um, to totally, I, I totally relate to that. I think the first time, I'll never forget the first time that Patrick went to a uh, support group and, um, they watched this video that gave him some education on addiction and the brain and what was happening. He came back because I had driven him, right? This was so early on. This is like week one. So like I drove him to make sure he went, right? <laughs> like yeah. All of those things in the beginning. Like you have to go where you have to, you're telling me you're going to recover. You have to prove it. Um, but I drove him and he got in there. I remember after this was like the first week. So there had been so much drama and so many tears and so much discovery. And then he got back in the car and he was so excited. He was like lit up because it was like, there's hope. Yep. They have step-by-step -step ways for me to like get out of this. And I he was like for the first time, cause he had tried many times before I discovered him on his own to, uh, to do it himself. And, um, so when he went in there and it was so clear that there is hope and this is what's happening in your body and this is why it was so hard for you. He was like bouncing off the walls happy. And I was like, Oh my gosh, like, you know, you're still in the midst of the pain and there's, but that provided so much hope too. 
Yeah. My husband had the, a very similar experience. Pretty much every men's group he goes to, the Sexaholics Anonymous meetings, pretty much all of those, he comes back and I can just see he feels relief. It's such an amazing, and I, I talk about it so much in my videos because it's like, if if men, if they can do, if they have to choose one thing in their recovery, if they only had to choose one thing, I would say the Sexaholics Anonymous meetings, they're just having those, the 12 step, you know, the 12 step program and having that men around you who are telling you, you can do this. You got this. Like we're in this together. Community. It's just like more than anything. I think mm -hmm. that is just so helpful. And I love, I've just really loved seeing he's never had that. He's never been, he, he's had mm -hmm. good men in his life. Um, but as we all know, they all struggled the same thing he struggled with. Okay. So this it's, it's community of men being vulnerable and honest with each other and the opposite of addiction is community so yes. here you have a community of men yeah. that are acknowledging the addiction and yeah. saying we're, we're going to support you working through it and that's huge for somebody who never had that before and that's why i think the number one reason they fail on their own is because when they don't have uh when they're not speaking it out loud that it's an issue and they don't have the community they're going to fail yeah because literally the opposite of addiction is community. So if you don't have that, what are you doing? Exactly. You can, it, it is a secret that, or it is a, um, an addiction that thrives in shame and secrecy. And so literally in order to heal, you have to rip off the shame and the secrecy. So exactly. it has to be something that you talk about with somebody. It doesn't have to be public like us. <laughs> right, 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 right. Yeah. Not everyone's going to be, be on TikTok and Facebook and Instagram. Like, so let me tell you about my porn addiction. Like, <laughs> yeah. But you do have to talk about it in some way with someone that is safe. Yeah. And that has to happen, I think. Okay, so what's number five? I think we're on number five. Am I right? Yeah, I have number five here. Um, Just um, whenever men believe that they believe, just like every single addiction, this is relieving my stress. This is helping my anxiety. This is okay. helping my depression. They think it is helping yeah. But then it is actually like that vicious cycle. It is contributing to your stress, your depression, your self-esteem. Mm -hmm. It's contributing so yeah. much to all of that. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, it's so true. And I think, I think because it's not talked about, right? The fact that the reason you want to objectify humans, actually, here's the thing that I've come to understand about it. And, and I don't know if maybe you're um, on the same page with this or not, because I don't think this is necessarily true for every guy. Some guys, I think it, they really are into the women and all this kind of stuff. But I think most of the time when you have a guy that is sucked into this world, it's more about compulsive masturbation than it is like, oh, I love the women and I want the women and I, yeah. you know, all this kind of stuff. Because, yeah. because it is a means to an end right. to get the dopamine hit to, to numb yeah. the emotion that they don't want to feel. Yes. So then, it, then, first of all, that's comforting to us, <laughs> which I really, oh man, did I drill the questions about that? Cause I was like, what yep. is it, you know? And, and then I kind of, kind of found, I, I, after all those questions, I was like, okay, I think it's actually, it's a means to an end. That's what it is. It's not about the thing itself. It is a means to an end. And that is why it is so important that they acknowledge that, like you're saying, because it will not go away until you address the wound itself. Why is that happening? You know, they have some sort of um, belief about themselves that they're unworthy or they're unlovable or, you know, something is in there that they go, okay, attention from these women or looking at these women or what, you know, depending on what they were involved in is going to fulfill that for me. It's going to fill that void. Then it doesn't. Then the cycle repeats because the initial thing isn't addressed. Right. And, and so it's, I mean, that's a huge, I mean, I think it's such a huge thing because we don't talk about why this is happening. Yeah. And I think when, I think that's actually really encouraging to guys to actually say, you know, hey, you've been traumatized and it doesn't have to be like a huge thing. Like everybody has trauma. We have these events in our lives where we create these stories out of them and we create these identities out of them or, or these beliefs about ourselves. And we do that too, right? There's a lot of identities and beliefs that you and I have created out of the story of our betrayal that we also have to work through. Yeah. And um, I think that's highly encouraging for men when they actually figure that out because then they're like, oh, yeah, okay, that makes and so much sense. 
And it's like you were saying, the majority of men who watch porn, I think were just like your husband and my husband. And I, because we, we ask the questions, we just have a never, never ending flow of questions about their addiction and everything. And there have been so many times that my husband has said to me, Jordan, like if I would say a specific day or time or whatever, like, oh, did you watch porn this time or whatever? Yeah. And he would, he has said so much, Jordan, there were so many times I didn't even want to do it. And I just did it like they, and that's this thing is like, they like, like they have to feed that, that dopamine and everything that they've been feeding for 12, 15, 20 years. And that's what he says so much. And he's like, whenever I would say, why did you keep doing it? And he would even say, I don't know. He said, most of the time I didn't even want to, and I just did it. And it's like, like you said, like, it's comforting. It's comforting that it's like, it helps me understand it's an addiction. And I remember I was in a group for betrayal trauma for women and the, it was a counselor that was running it. And, you know, we were talking about all the questions we have regarding porn addiction and sex addiction. And it's something that she said that I really appreciated was she was like, we don't want to fully understand the why, because we don't want to go into the mind of an addict because it's so warped. There's no reasoning. It's so warped. There's no justification. There's no, there is no explanation that is going to make sense Mm -hmm. because of how warped their brains are from this. So she was like, you know, we can ask all these questions, but she was like, at the end of the day, we're not going to understand why, you know what I mean? Like, why did you have to watch this? Why did you have to watch that? Like, she was like, we can kind of get the big picture. And then there's some details that like, we just will never pick up. And (laughs) To a point, it's like, that's okay. We don't need to know. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Don't over traumatize. I talk about that in my course too, about like what you want to know and what you don't want to know. Yeah. Like you definitely need to know a lot. And also you definitely don't need to know a lot of details because you're just asking to be more traumatized. Yeah. <laughs> like, and, and in our own cool. healing journey, it's like, you know, we have to be careful when you go through discovery and asking these questions because there is a point where you do need to know because uh you know we need to have con- a full uh, understanding of, of the process and what's going on in order to set boundaries and all this kind of stuff and there are some specific things that we need to be careful not to ask because what we're doing there is creating trigger points for ourselves yes. that are going to make it more difficult for us to heal in the long run yeah and so you know i kind of talk about those things too because it's like i want anyone going through that to be as successful as possible, get the information you need, and then also protect your mind as much as you can. Yeah, that's the other thing our counselor was telling us, you know, she was like, she told me, withhold as many questions as you can do your best to not ask too many questions, because we were going to do the full disclosure and all of that. But you know, what she said, and this is true for all of us. Once you ask a question, and they give you an answer, that image will never leave your head it will never leave your head. You know what I'm saying? So it's like some of the details that you want answers to, you don't actually want answers to. Yeah. Because I've asked my husband, oh my God, a million and one different scenarios and questions. And it's like, I, I, I'm i like screaming at him, give me the truth, give me the truth. And the second I get the truth, I wish mm-hmm. I would have never asked it because it's mm-hmm. like, I know for as long as I live, I'm going to be 90 years old. That image is going to be in my head. You know, I'm not going to actively think about it, but it's going to be there. And it's, it's hard. It's so hard. It's like that razor thin line of, it's so hard to know. Okay. What is okay for me to know that I can potentially heal from? And then what is on that other side that is like, it's going to destroy me. You know, it's hard. It is hard. There's, it's so hard. Yeah. And then I would encourage anybody watching too, like there's a difference between talk therapy and um, additional trauma modalities that these practitioners bring in like brain spotting or EMDR or things like that, because there's no way to get through this, I think, without having some images like that or some triggers. I mean, there's just no way no because way. The, the, the basic information itself is massively traumatizing. Yeah. 
So um, we're trying to get you to not traumatize yourself more <laughs> than you have to. And then when you're going through this process, working with a practitioner that does have specific trauma modalities outside of talking to you, because when those things get stuck, those trauma modalities help your brain file it away so it's not, it doesn't hold as much emotional charge and it doesn't keep popping up to the front as frequently. And so that in combination with the safety and stability uh, of recovery being consistent over time is ultimately what allows the recovery for the betrayed partner to occur. But I think sometimes women will get stuck in, and I'm assuming going um, going through resources like Doug Weiss and stuff like that, you have access to like EMDR and, and stuff like that. Yeah. But I think sometimes women um, get stuck in the talking and that can end up being more traumatizing when you're reliving and re-identifying your experience over and over and over without any sort of brain processing techniques to file it away to a safe place. Yeah. And, and without that, it, the pain is going to stay. Yeah. Um, and so we want to create the safety in the relationship and the environment. So you have that consistency and trust can begin to build. And then whatever pain has created these triggers in your mind, we want to then begin processing those so that we can start recovery for ourselves and our, our mental health, because yeah. otherwise that, that they can get really stuck and loop, like you're saying. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Um, we do have a question. If you have a couple minutes. Yeah, um, I do. So one of the things that she uh, asked was we had talked about, I had mentioned it's really impossible for them to stop on their own. So she's, she said, impossible to stop on their own. Where, where do I find that info? My husband stopped seeing the CSAT ooh, and is only seeing a biblical counselor. Uh-oh. <laughs> they think God's grace is bigger than the addiction. Oh, okay. This might be a long answer, but uh, I'll let you take a shot at it first. Let's, let's see. This is a tricky one. This is a tricky um, one. Well, impossible to stop on their own. I mean, really, any. I'm, I'm sure. I don't. I would. I. I would just if they're seeing a biblical counselor. Uh, God. God can do anything. God can do anything. I believe that with all of my heart. Um, but I also know that there are certain things. Obviously, we're human. You know, we need. There are certain things that are. You can't just pray and expect. You can't life, just pray right away. Yeah, you can't just pray and expect a lifelong addiction to go away. I mean, I, I think we've all had different addicts in our lives, and it's prayer. Mm -hmm. God has other things in this world to help us through addictions. Um, and also, I would say the if if he, if if your husband is only doing counseling or only doing therapy. I mean, 100% they need at the bare minimum, like accountability apps. I don't know if, if this person's husband has that or not, but I think that a lot of times men will just pick one thing and say, okay, this is going to help me through my addiction. Oh, this counselor or this mm -hmm. therapist, or, okay, I'll go to a group once a week and that's going to heal me. But you need everything you can get in place, everything you can get. A yes. sex addiction therapist is... I think one of the bare minimum section sex addiction therapists, the men's groups at least once a week and accountability apps. Oh, I totally. think that is, if you have any hope of recovery, I don't know why a man would stop seeing a sex addiction therapist because uh -uh. a biblical counselor, I mean, I'm, I'm sure that they can do a lot as far as your faith and they can do a lot spiritually for you, but I don't, I don't think they're going to be able to really help heal a sex addiction, you know? No. Yeah. You need to be specialized in that area. Uh, yeah, you have to be. And I see more harm than good come from church counselors, honestly, when it comes to this stuff, which is really unfortunate. So, you know, yes, absolutely. God can heal anything. But I like the analogy of the man that is being buried in the snowdrift and he's praying, God, please rescue me from death, you know? And so God, like then this uh, snowmobile comes along and says, hey, man, can, can I help you? And he goes, no, no, I'm waiting for God to help me. And the snowmobile goes on. And then a sled comes up 30 minutes later and says, hey, man, can I help you? And he goes, no, no, I'm waiting for God to rescue me. Like, what is he going to do? Like, poof, I'm out of the snowmobile. Yes. No, you have to accept help accept from people it, yeah. on earth that can help you. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's like if you are um, 
I don't know, let's just say you're 600 pounds overweight and you're praying to be healthy, right? Are you going to just magically wake up one day and be healthy? Or are you going to have to make choices? Are you going to have to hire coaches? Are you going to have to hire accountability? Like you're going to have to learn some things and educate yourself on like, you know, there's trauma there too, right? Like what, yeah. what is surrounding this? Yeah. And this exact same thing with any addiction, with any behavior we want to change, we have to get to it at the root. And yes, God can work miracles, but nine out of 10 times, he needs you to take action on this earth in order for those things to occur. He doesn't just snap his fingers and go, you know, oh, I'm going to fix it for you. And I think when people, I think when people do that, it's spiritually bypassing, which is actually a sign that they're not willing to do the work. That God is yeah. not going to snap his fingers if you are not willing to do the work, because if your heart is not willing to face the pain, God is not just going to magically bypass the work that it takes for you to heal. There are so, there's so much learning yeah. through the healing process that is uncomfortable. And I think when, when men spiritually bypass, then they're doing that because they want to avoid the pain. And unfortunately, the reality is that the pain serves a purpose. Yes. And that there is a lot of healing that occurs through that. Yeah. And I think like with her husband seeing the biblical counselor, there are so many different tools that I'm sure can help your husband. I think a biblical counselor is probably a great tool in addition with a therapist and all these other things. I don't think it's helpful at all to say one or the other. If he can go to a biblical counselor and he can go to an addiction therapist and he can go to men's groups because she did put there that I guess... He's not, he's refusing to go to men's groups. And I think another thing is for men and women in marriages where the man has this sex addiction, I see it as the man, if he really cares about getting help, I think that he should be willing to do whatever his, basically whatever his wife is asking of him. If that is therapy three times a week, if you can afford it, whatever that means. Yeah. If your wife, you know, if she's saying, I want you to go to this men's group because I think it will help you, what what possible reason? There's not going to be too much help. He can't get too no. much help, but he can get too little help, you know? Absolutely. I totally agree with that. And I think on the, the perspective of the wife, again, it's not about controlling the addiction on your end. It's about creating boundaries that say, this is what it, it's going to take in order to remain in a relationship with me. And when, when betrayal is there in order to build trust, it's completely reasonable for you to set boundaries that include things like, I expect you to go to a, a, a trauma therapist that is familiar with sex addiction. I expect you to go to a group once a week. And this is going to go on for a minimum of six months, then we can reassess or whatever. But the reality is that recovery, true recovery, takes two to five years for a man in yes. these situations. And so it's not, a lot of times what happens is they'll get six months in, They'll go, oh, I'm not doing the behavior anymore. I feel so much better. I'm not going to do any, just kidding. I'm not going to do all this other stuff anymore because I'm just back to normal. And that is a number one sign that they're not actually in recovery yep. because relapse actually occurs primarily when they get a little too confident in their recovery and they stop all of the activities and support and engaging in all of these things that we're talking about, all these groups and therapy and stuff that we're talking about that help them get into sobriety in the first place. Recovery involves a lot of deep heart change. And so when a man is in recovery, you see him proactively going to all of these things, journaling, doing his homework, going to group, going to a CSAT. Like if you question him on it, he's like, cool, do you want me to go to two? Do you want, like you were saying, do you want me to go to two? Do you want me to go to three? Like how many times a week do I need to go, right? When they are really in the heart change mode and in deep recovery, they are proactive. They're not pulling away from it. Yeah. And so that actually brings me um, a lot of concern about where he is in his recovery if he's not willing to do those things. She mentioned he doesn't want to go to the CSAT because the CSAT isn't a Christian. I get that. I mean, you want to have like the, the foundational like same belief system of like porn is wrong. And so, honestly, some CSATs don't always promote that. Um, but as long as this is a CSAT that is like, no, it's wrong. Here are the steps. I'll walk you through a full disclosure. I will get you, you know, connected to support groups. Like if they're willing to kind of take you through those steps, then, um, go back. And if, if the, if you're not liking the CSAT because their worldview is just too different from yours, there are CSATs that you can travel to for intensives. Yes. There are 
sets that will do virtual. There are resources out there, but I would highly recommend that that is a boundary that like you have to be working with somebody that is working in sex addiction and recovery because that is just so different from biblical counselors whose only tool they have to give you is read your Bible more and pray more, which all of these Christian addicts, my husband read the Bible uh, in a year twice during his, his, while his addiction was escalating. So he was making extreme attempts to get closer to God and be a good Christian while his addiction was actually escalating and getting worse. Yeah. So it's not the answer. They need the community. They need the tools. They need the support um, and the reality of that. And then as the spouse who's choosing to stay, you have a lot of um, say in what happens because it's, again, not about controlling that person. It's about establishing protection measures for you, for what makes you feel safe, and then for what you will tolerate in your relationship moving forward. And if they're not willing to, you know, have those conversations, then that's a different scenario that that needs to be addressed that's you know that's a whole other thing yeah well jordan thank you this has been such a great um conversation um what is there anything else that you would like to to leave people with in terms of you know a best resource that's been most helpful for you or any any kind of thoughts or words that you want to leave people with um just two things number one if you are with someone who needs recovery Um, Like I already said, the three things, you know, the sex addiction therapist, the sexaholics anonymous meetings, not those other ones, like the sexaholics anonymous, you know, and the accountability apps. Those three things I think are really the key, the Mm -hmm. foundation of where to start, you know, the bare minimum. Those three are the bare minimum. The other thing that I just really want to people to understand. And I don't know the pe- your audience, I think a lot of them maybe are already in this. So they're already in the recovery. But my thing that I've realized a lot, like I, we already said at the beginning of this is that if you are dating a man or you're out, you know, or whatever, you're married or whatever, if you're with a man and he says to you, like my husband had told me in the past, I used to watch porn. Oh, I watched porn as a teenager or whatever. If you are with a man and he says, yeah, I've seen porn before. Ask him this. If you want to know if he's still watching it, ask him this. Okay. When did you recover and how did you recover from that? That How did you recover from that? And if they don't have a concrete, this is how I stopped watching porn. These are the steps I took. They are still watching it because a lot of men, I notice a lot of men will say, oh, I just grew out of it. Oh, I just, no, they didn't. They're lying to you because they're downplaying their what they are doing because they don't want you to know. And so that's the number, I would definitely say that. Yeah. I absolutely love that question because that is a question that that you get a lot is, okay, well, if you know, you're getting divorced after recovery and you're going to start dating again or people watching this going, what the heck, like I'm dating or engaged or whatever. And this is my first marriage. How do I avoid this? That, That is a great question because I, I too had that conversation and he was like, yes, I was into it at one point. I didn't like who I was becoming and I stopped. Hmm. Interesting. Here we are 10 years later with like a full blown, you know? Yeah. Cool. So I love that because that's so true. Someone that has done the work is able to tell you what it was that they were self-medicating, how they got into it. And they'll also be able to tell you how they stopped. So I think that's an excellent question. Yeah. Awesome. Well, how can people find you on social media and uh, follow your story and your journey? Yeah. So on TikTok, obviously that's where I post everything. Um, it's caring moments. Uh, K-E-H-R-I-N-G moments. Uh, that's on my TikTok. And then just my name on Instagram, if anyone wants to reach out to me on there, because you can't really talk to people on TikTok unless you each follow each other. And that's yes. Jordan Care. Um, I don't know if you have my name. I know you posted it in your Instagram. My name is there, Jordan Care. So. Perfect. Yeah. I'll, I'll put uh, the links below as well and um, for anybody watching so they can connect with you. But thanks so much, Jordan. I really appreciate it. And, uh, you know, I think you are encouraging a lot of people. And I hope that through this process, you get a lot of encouragement and positive feedback as well, because what you're doing is so brave. Thank you so much.